with you. Can you all hear me all right? Okay. I'm sad to be this far away from you all, but I hope we can uh, get some uh, participation and interaction as we go. Rather than speaking for 40 minutes and having 20 minutes of Q&A, what I'd like to do is uh, speak in little chunks of time and then open it up for questions and comments as we go. Right? So if that means if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and at a natural stopping point, I'll, uh, I'll take the question as we go. It's a small enough group that we can have ample interaction um, and we'll stop when we stop, okay? Um, by which I mean, uh, if I can't get through my whole manuscript, that's okay with me. So we uh, we're stopping at 8, uh, 8.30, I believe, is our closing time. So we'll see how much this would get through. Uh, in front of you, you have a bit of a roadmap of where we'd like to go this evening. Um, I'm going to first give just a bit of a biographical sketch of Jonathan Edwards, who he was. I'll go look over his entire life, and then I'll circle back to some major intellectual themes, particularly um, that he was interested in as a thinker and Christian theologian. And then we'll look particularly at the awakenings. There's a little mini awakening, and then we'll look at the great awakening and we'll look at some of the themes that come out of that that might be still resonant in our day today, all right? So, we're here for the 300th anniversary of this church. So it's fitting that exactly 300 years ago today, on Thursday, May 2nd, 1723, a 19-year-old Jonathan Edwards awoke from a fitful night of sleep and wrote in his diary the following. I think it a very good way to examine dreams every morning when I awake. What are the nature, circumstances, principles, and, and ends of my imaginary actions and passions in them to discern what are my chief inclinations, etc. That such a paragraph should come 120 years before Freud from the pen of a Puritan preacher famed for his sternness would come to many as a surprise. The Edwards of history and the Edwards of popular mythology have only the smallest overlap, as I intend to show this evening. He was far more intellectually creative and psychologically penetrating than our caricatures of him suggest. He was, as this paragraph suggests, aware of the hidden depths of the self, which we would only 200 years later learn to call the subconscious. He was, in short, ahead of his time in more ways than just his fascination with dreams. And it is my task this evening to introduce Jonathan Edwards and say something about the various ways that he was ahead of his time, that the intervening decades and centuries bear his mark even while they occasionally distort his legacy. And I'll do so through attention to his life and theology, especially as that life and theology intersected with the Great Awakening, which took place in the lands of Southern Connecticut that we call home. My hope is to show the various ways in which we are heirs to a legacy that Edwards decisively shaped. To begin, I'd like to give a bit of a biographical sketch of Edwards. Every October, runners in the Hartford Marathon wind past an old home, equal parts regal and austere, in East Windsor, Connecticut. By my memory, it's around mile 16, right when it's starting to hurt. There, on October 5th, 1703, Jonathan Edwards was born. He was the only son of Timothy Edwards, the only brother of his 10 sisters. Timothy Edwards uh, was very tall. He liked to speak of his 60 feet of daughters, 10 daughters, each at least six feet high. His mother, Esther Stoddard, daughter of Solomon Stoddard, a preacher so influential and domineering that he was sometimes known as the Pope of the Connecticut River Valley, and at least one enslaved African named Anzars, completed the Edwards household. Edwards was, by every standard, a prodigy. He would enroll at Yale College at the age of 13 but not before many afternoons of assembling huts in the woods with his friends where they would go pray together. 
While out in the woods, he would often for hours observe the behavior of spiders. Culminating in a scientific article, he submitted to an English scientific association for publishing when he was 11 years old. He was fascinated in the way the spiders would let out a thin filament of string to catch the wind and travel by this. He was full of scientific wonder from a, the young age of 11. Finally, he would graduate at the top of his class at Yale and become, after a short time, tutor there. He was fantastically focused in his intellectual life. And yet, in 1729, while studying for his MA at Yale, he began to leave traces in some of his notebooks of an uncharacteristic distraction. The most extended and telling of these distractions comes written in the cover of the Greek grammar, which he was quite clearly failing to study with any attentiveness. It read as follows. They say there is a young lady in New Haven who is beloved of that almighty being who made and rules the world and that there are seasons in which this great being in some way or other invisible comes to her and fills her mind with exceeding sweet delight and that she hardly cares for anything except to meditate on him, that she expects after a while to be received up where he is, to be raised up out of the world and caught up into heaven, being assured that he loves her too well to let her remain at a distance from him always. There she is to dwell with him and to be ravished with his love and delight forever. Therefore, if you present all the world before her with all the riches of its treasures, she disregards it and cares not for it and is unmindful of any pain or affliction. She has a strange sweetness in her mind and singular purity in her affections. She is most just and conscientious in all her actions, and you could not persuade her to do anything wrong or sinful if you gave her all the world, lest she should offend the great being. She is of a wonderful sweetness calmness, and universal benevolence of mind, especially after those seasons in which the great God has manifested himself to her mind. She will sometimes go about from place to place, singing sweetly, and seems to be always of joy and pleasure, and no one knows for what. She loves to be alone, and to wander in the fields and on the mountains, and seems to have someone invisible always conversing with her. Her name was Sarah Pierpont, and they were shortly married thereafter. Sarah seems by all accounts, of course, what a great letter, right? I mean, how can you not, how can not that, that not serve its purpose? Sarah seems by all accounts to have been an exemplary woman. In addition to giving birth to 11 children, as well as managing the affairs of the house, a task for which the impractical and scholarly Edwards was particularly altogether unqualified, she was, as Edwards' description suggests, a mystic. There were times when she had ecstatic experiences, mystical visions, and even new historical records suggest she may have levitated in prayer. Harry Stout at Yale is currently writing a biography of Sarah Pierpont, as well as a biography of Timothy Dwight, uh, coming out sometime in the next few years. And this is one of the sources that he'll be looking at in his treatment of Sarah Pierpont. By the way, that's a very interesting story if you think about um, the way Protestantism is often narrated as being sort of almost anti-supernatural, it's rational. Uh, the Catholics are the ones with, the, with mystical visions, and if any Protestant has mystical visions, it's those weird Pentecostals, not the austere Calvinist Puritans. And here's Sarah Pierpont, maybe levitating in prayer. In 1727, when he was 24 years old, Edwards is appointed a pastor and aide to his grandfather by marriage, Solomon Stoddard. Stoddard was an exacting and imperious influence. 
a towering figure who governed the second largest church in New England after the Congregational Church of Boston, where the Mathers reigned, another Puritan aristocratic family. Two years after Edwards was appointed there, Stoddard died, leaving the 26-year-old Edwards solely in charge of the church, where he would minister for another 21 years until 1750, when he was removed from his congregation after a disagreement about the Lord's Supper. It is here in this period of Northampton that most of the drama of our time tonight will take place. But after he departed uh, from Northampton, he also had a few more adventures that I'll allude to as we go. But while in Northampton, he led an intensely scholarly life. He preached between 1,200 and 1,400 times over the course of his lifetime. It was not uncommon for his sermons to be two hours long, written out longhand. You can uh, go to the Beinecke Rare Book Library at Yale and hold them in your hands. He had this very strange way of doing it. Um, he wanted to be able to gesticulate while he read, and so he uh, took a folio paper and uh, wrapped it into sixteenths until it was about this big, and his handwriting is altogether inscrutable. Maybe 20 lines on a piece of paper like this. He'd sew the seam together, and he'd palm it as he preached. Um, it's amazing that he could do that. Um, and one of the reasons why Edwards' sermons, despite his popularity, have still never been fully made available to the public is I just can't tell you how excruciatingly difficult it is to read his shorthand in extremely small lettering. But we're working on it. Let's be patient. We're going to get them all done eventually. In addition to his uh, scholarly output in sermons, he was participating in theological and doctrinal controversies, as well as pursuing his own constructive theological projects. The major ones he failed to complete before his untimely death. He was working on a body of divinity in a manner entirely new, and he died before he could finish it. After that time in Northampton, he became a pastor and missionary in Stockbridge, where he, which was then a frontier town. He preached to the Native Americans frequently through a translator, and his theological writings display a hope that great theologians would come from among the Native Americans. Around 1758, he receives an invitation from the trustees of the College of New Jersey, now called Princeton, to be their president. He is extremely hesitant to take the job, but they talk him into it, and Edwards sets out in a wagon to New Jersey to set his affairs straight and prepare for his family to join him there months later. They would never make it. Before they could join him, a smallpox epidemic broke out. <laughs> to encourage widespread vaccination, the president of the college was first in line, but something went wrong with the vaccination. His throat and mouth became swollen. He may have gotten smallpox, and it was impossible to get even fluid into his stomach. He knew he was dying, and he summoned to his side his daughter Lucy, who had accompanied him to Princeton, and gave her his last recorded words. Dear Lucy, it seems to me to be the will of God that I must shortly leave you. Therefore, give my kindest love to my dear wife and tell her, that the uncommon union which has so long subsisted between us has been of such a nature as I trust is spiritual and therefore will continue forever. As to my children, you are now like to be left fatherless, which I hope will be an inducement to you all to seek a father who shall never fail you. On March 22nd, 1758, at the age of 55, Edwards died. He is buried in Princeton Cemetery, just a few blocks outside of the university's gates and Nassau Hall. That's a brief overview of his life and the major pieces of his biography. I've said little about his ideas, but are there any questions at this early moment about Edwards' biography? I flag for you at the end, bottom of your handout uh, recommended readings. Um, this is the magisterial biography of Jonathan Edwards from George Marsden, um, professor of history at Notre Dame. It's about 20 years old. I think there may be another um, biography of Edwards 
in the offing in the next 10 or 15 years, I think. There's enough new material, but this is just magisterial. It won the Bancroft Prize, perhaps the most uh, prestigious prize in all of history. I recommend it to you if you're interested. That's the Edwards biography. I also put the Edwards Center's website there for you. One of the things that is amazing about Jonathan Edwards uh, at the current moment is that all of his writing is in English and English is a global language. And as the last few years, all of his writings are now on the internet. So there are a number of scholars from all over the world doing their PhDs on Edwards just online. Many of them doing uh, internet, the, their doctoral work basically on their phone. Uh, and they come in the summers to visit the Edwards Center scholars in New Haven. Um, in some way, the tide of Edwards uh, studies um, was at its height in America maybe 10, 15 years ago, but around the world it, it is still not uh, crested yet. He's still a major figure. And one of the major uh, reasons for that is the completion of the publication of the works of Jonathan Edwards in their Yale critical edition, which looked like this. Um, and many of them are quite cheap, many of them are fantastically expensive, but if you're interested in Edwards, you can buy this volume on The Great Awakening and all of his writings for about 20 bucks. It's not bad at all. All the critical apparatus in, you, in there. Okay, there are my suggestions for further reading. If there are any questions, yes, please. He, he, may, he may have for a few months. Um, he definitely preached at, in Stockbridge, um, and that was the frontier of Massachusetts at that point. Um, there's some possibility that the house they lived in, at least temporarily, was part of the um, defensive wall around the city, um, and there were frequently uh, Indian Native American attacks in that area. It's a fascinating uh, uh, topic, Edwards and the Native Americans. Um, uh, yeah, he speaks through a translator, um, he speaks in very clear sentences, and the metaphors are like, particularly vivid and non-philosophical. It, it's amazing if you meet people who are extremely bright, sometimes they can't speak like a normal human being, right? Um, Edwards is a fantastic example of profound erudition who, when he knows he's speaking through a translator who doesn't know all the finer points of, say, Cambridge Platonism, doesn't use those terms, um, just speaks very clearly to them. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing bit of enculturation. Anything else right now on, on Edwards' biography? Okay. Edwards as an intellectual synthesizer. What ought to be said first about Jonathan Edwards is that he was a synthesizer of intellectual traditions commonly considered antithetical to each other and of which few, if any, of his heirs have been able successfully to hold together. As a Yale student, he familiarized himself with Locke's epistemology, Newton's theory of optics, while writing long refutations of Hobbes and Spinoza's criticism of the Bible. He was a natural scientist, as well as an orthodox Calvinist who believes that sin clouds natural reason. If in America today we might say that there is a religious class who is relatively uh, lower educated and a intellectual class which is relatively less religious, Edwards straddles that divide. And it's been hard to keep those two things together in American life in the intervening time. Edwards is magisterial in his ability to synthesize. What he is most famous for, however, is captured well in one phrase from a recent cultural blockbuster. In Hamilton, Lin-Manuel Miranda has Alexander Hamilton say, or rather rap, that his grandfather was a fire and brimstone preacher. The grandfather to which he's referring is Jonathan Edwards. But the distillation of his existence into this one phrase is an intellectual travesty caused by events far after Hamilton's own life. Yes, Edwards was the grandfather of Aaron Burr, who killed Alexander Hamilton. It's a very productive family. Edwards is sinners in the hands of an angry god, anthologized in various compilations of famous English literature, it is the first and very commonly the only introduction to Edwards that most Americans ever receive. 
This legacy of Edwards lives on today, both in street preachers who might echo exactly Edwards's warnings about coming judgment, albeit with far less artistry than he possessed, but also wherever the rhetorical form of the Jeremiah is to be heard. If you're familiar with sinners, you'll know the vividness of the metaphors. The Lord who holds you over the pit of hell, like one might hold a spider over a flame, is incensed with you, is as repulsed by you as you are by that noxious insect. These are the metaphors that he uses. It's a rhetorical form called the Jeremiah. The sense that the audience has abandoned the covenant, that judgment is coming and is well deserved if repentance is not enacted and enacted swiftly. Everyone in his audience would know how to flee the wrath that is to come, and therefore he felt no need to say it explicitly. Christ was the one who would save them from the flame. But the Jeremiah, I want to suggest, lives on today. It takes its name from the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament, who wept over the apostasy of Israel and begged Israel to return to the covenant. It is an impassioned rhetoric, marked typically by lurid descriptions of moral decay and corruption, which all stem from having forsaken the original covenant with God. But God is merciful, says the prophet, and will happily accept back those who return to the covenant and abandon their wicked ways, cleanse their hands of unrighteousness, and pursue righteousness. We hear this rhetoric echo a century later in, for example, Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. He, when he asks those present at the Ladies' Anti-Slavery Society of Rochester on July 4th, 1852, quote, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in the Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? Of course, Douglas goes on to say, he cannot do so because the blessings of liberty enshrined in the Declaration have not been extended to the black slave. Quote, whether we turn to the declarations of the past or the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. A A America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. This appeal is a Jeremiah, especially the theme of faithfulness to the original vision and the warning of judgment if no repentance is at hand. None of these themes or rhetorical devices would have been unfamiliar to Edwards, except, of course, the call for immediate abolition of those slaves, which Edwards did not have the wisdom or justice to call for, though many of his successors did. This is one of the stories you can tell about the, the New England theology, that out of Edwards' influence come both defenders of slavery, as he himself was, and also abolitionists against slavery. His legacy is contested. But this is not all there was to Edwards, this fire and brimstone preacher. He was also a nature mystic, which is a tradition whose distant forerunner was St. Francis of Assisi of the 1300s, and whose heirs are Thoreau, Emerson, Whitman. I need not tell any of you the beauties of autumn in southern New England, or the relief of spring after a nasty, brutish, and short days of the New England winter, nor would we have to had, ha have to had inform Edwards of these beauties. He knew them in his bones. 
He experienced them whenever possible on horseback, and while riding, he would indicate in the back cover of his notebooks about nature the dates in the spring when the cherry, peach, plum, and apple trees would first bloom. He was an aesthetic theologian and a scientist, and these two came together for him. By the way, he was also wildly eccentric um, when thoughts would come to him uh, while riding he would have a system of memory by which he would take little scraps of paper and he would write the thought down on them, pin the paper to various parts of his coat, and when he got back, his wife would unpin all the papers. She said sometimes he would return back home looking quite like a porcupine. A friend of mine recently observed um, that uh, he thinks Edwards uh, invented texting while driving with this activity. I think he's right. But for Edwards, flowers in the New England spring were signs of more than just natural beauty. They were images of deeper spiritual truths as well. Roses grow up in briars, he once noted himself, which is obvious enough to any of the many gardeners I hear who occupy this church. But he continued, this is to signify that all temporal sweetnesses are mixed with bitterness. But what seems more especially to be meant by it is that true happiness, the crown of glory, is to, be, is to come in no other way than by bearing Christ's cross, by a life of mortification, self-denial, and labor and bearing all things for Christ. Edwards' rumination on these flowers and their spiritual meaning was the outworking of a particular vision of the world through his typological imagination. To have a typological imagination is to see metaphors, images, shadows, pictures of spiritual facts represented in the most quotidian artifacts of life. We might be tempted to call them hidden metaphors, images, shadows, and pictures, but Edwards would, sa would say rather not that they are hidden, but that we are blind to them. The nature is screaming out God's glory, and we close our ears, close our eyes to their messages. When Edwards turned his attention to answering the question of why God created the world, a long treatise, he writes, called The End for Which God Created the World, he wrote that no kind of lack or deficiency in God could explain the creation of the world. The Trinitarian persons of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit so perfectly, fully, and infinitely express their love within and between themselves that they lack nothing in the expression of it. But the world is here. Therefore, it must be a kind of surplus, not deficiency, that led God to create the world, an overflowing of love and goodness. What God was aiming at, Edwards finally arrives at, was the communication of his glory outside of the Trinity to created minds. Communication, then, is key to God's plans for the world, and the Puritans believe that God communicated through the book of nature and the book of scripture, these two famous books. I'm not sure when last you've looked at the crest of Harvard, but the original crest had two books open and one book closed. If you look at the Harvard crest tonight, you'll notice that all three books are now turned face open, face forward. The two original books being open were probably meant to be the book of nature and the book of scripture. And the third book being closed was to signify, as Deuteronomy says, the secret things of the Lord belong to the Lord. There are mysteries into which the human mind cannot plumb. The trustees of Harvard no longer believe such nonsense about the mysteries of God, and they've opened God's mind up to their scientists and their telescopes. 
But for Edwards, both of these books were typological. The New Testament itself said as much. For example, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul, discussing the Exodus, says this, I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. A strange passage, no doubt. The strangest phrase in it might be the claim that the rock from which the ancient Jews in the wilderness drew their water was somehow Christ. And again, in Hebrews, the author, after describing the Jewish temple ceremonies, writes this, Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but unto heaven itself. The word copy there is used twice. These are images of something greater than themselves. The temple is a little bit of heaven. It images heaven. In each of these passages, the author is interpreting the Old Testament and suggests that significant moments in the life of Israel point to their culmination in Christ, who is the fulfillment of God's story with God's people. But the New Testament tells us that more of reality is typological as well, not just the Old Testament, but nature. Look at the birds of the air, says Jesus. They neither sow nor reap, nor store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And again, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I tell you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And if God so clothes the grass, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not also clothe you, O you of little faith? The very existence of birds and lilies, Jesus seems to be suggesting, is for the sake of communicating God's love to the world. God is trying to get your attention in the birds and the lilies. He's communicating to you. He's been doing it since you were born. If only you would have eyes to see and ears to hear. In fact, he's doing it all the time, Edward says. There are messages from God hidden in the universe, and there are potentially an infinite number of these messages. He has a system of notebooks by which he pursues different projects, and one of them is called Images of Divine Things, in which he writes this. I am not ashamed to own that I believe the whole universe, heaven and earth, air and sea, and the divine constitution and history of the holy scriptures is full of images of divine things, as full as language is of words. And that the multitude of those things that I have mentioned are but a very small part of what is really intended to be signified and typified by these things. There is room for persons to be learning more and more of this language and seeing more of that which is declared in it to the end of the world without discovering all of it. Nature is a book, a language, and languages are infinite. And you can learn this language, Edward says. You can learn it through attention to scripture's metaphors, but also by gardening, by beholding the sunset, by paying attention to the physical realities of your life. Husbandmen, Edward says, are wont to prune their trees after the dead of winter, a little before the spring, when the time approaches for them to put forth and blossom with new life and rejoicing. So God is wont also to wound his saints a little before he revives them, after falls and long seasons of deadness, 
and to purge them and prepare them for revival and comfort. Edwards is seeing something about the nature of God's working toward God's loved ones in the task of pruning your fruit trees. We might deviate away from a straightforward recounting of Edwards' theory here to say something of its possible contemporary relevance. In a famous 1967 paper, The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis, Lynn White Jr. suggests that Christian theology is largely responsible for the degradation of the environment and the ravaging of the world that was occurring even back then in the 60s. By placing human beings at the center of the world, White argues, and by giving them dominion over the rest of the creation, Christian theology has set up the environmental catastrophe by presenting the world as open to the unguided, unchecked exploitation of human beings. Now, I will note in passing that I can't find anyone in the tradition of Christian theology until the late 20th century who makes arguments like these. And Lynn White's defenders in various seminars and colloquia that I've been a part of haven't ever given me a name yet. But hold on for just a second. Consider what Edwards might say about environmental collapse and its many tragedies. The world is full of images of divine things. But what are those images? What are they communicating to us? Mass extinctions mean that there are fewer communications from God running around that we can hear. We see less of Christ's beauty when all the silkworms are extinct. The cascade of catastrophic weather events, which are always in Edwards' mind a sign of God's judgment, make the universe sound more and more notes of God's impending judgment and wrath than about his steadfast love. It's difficult to look at the birds of the air amid massive die-offs, and there are no lilies of the valley in the midst of perpetual droughts. Edwards's natural typology can then, I think, help us in the work of conservation and stewardship for many reasons, but one new one is simply this. We want to hear what God has to say to us. Nature is God's communication, God's language, and we're not listening. We delete the messages before they come in. We are ignorant and quieted to the voice of God's communication with us. Those are some themes of Edwards as a synthesizer. Again, you might think the fire and brimstone stuff comes down through this Jeremiah tradition, while the nature mysticism comes in um, Emerson, Thoreau, Whitman, other transcendentalists of New England. Um, uh, one of the famous uh, Edwardsians alive today is Marilyn Robinson, the, eth the um, novelist. This is her Edwards as well. It's uh, Edwards the nature mystic. But you're not going to find much in Marilyn Robinson about uh, Edwards, the fire and brimstone preacher. My claim is that he's both, in fact. And it's hard to keep the two of those things together. And no one has yet found the beautiful synthesis of them that he was able to hit upon in his life. So those are some of the themes that animated his life. Of course, there are many others, but those are some that might be interested. Thoughts, questions, comments on those intellectual themes and Edwards as a synthesizer of them. Yes. So I'm interested. So many young people today who are I know they're not terrified when they're young, but anyway, they always say they want a spiritual life, but I'm not religious. Yeah. And what does Edwards have to say about that? Um he he would not be terribly interested in people being religious, first of all. He'd be interested in being Christian, right? Uh, uh, I think it, he would see something <clears throat> of the deinstitutionalization of religious life that he himself may have unwitt or unwittingly have contributed to. So I'll say in just a moment, but jump the gun a little bit, Whitfield is the major actor of the Great Awakening, and he's preaching in the open air outside of ecclesiastical supervision uh, without any mediating institutions. 
Now, of course, he's reading the Bible, and he's talking about sin and judgment and repentance, but it's still out in the open uh, in Boston Common. And what you can see is a, a gradual deinstitutionalization of religion in um, American life, which, of course, does not mean secularization. So many social scientists have thought that um, modernization means secularization, and the, uh, my sense is that they tend not to think that anymore. Uh, for reasons like this one, but also for uh, examples like India, China, and Africa, places where uh, religion development are happening simultaneously. So the secularization thesis is, is, is largely dead, I think. Uh, but in cases of the deinstitutionalization of religion, um, uh, the awakening may have been a bit complicit in it. Um, but I also want to make this one point, that uh, the awakening is, at its best, an attempt to critique and revive the institutions that are imperiled, embattled, or decayed. And my suspicion is that it's easier in many folks' cases to simply exit from those institutions altogether. So again, there's a famous economist in the 20th century, Albert Hirschman, who writes the book Exit Voice and Loyalty, Responses to Declines and Firms. And he is giving a typology of people's responses to when their institutions fall apart. Do you fall apart with it? Do you stay and fight, or do you wash your hands of it and leave? And I think one thing that might drive the spiritual but not religious movement is uh, the washing your hands of the corruption of organized religion. Um, at times it looks bureaucratic or stilted or stifling of the work of the spirit or uh, openly vicious in its uh, practices, say, toward um, uh, concealing the sexual abuse of children, for example. So it's hard to pin down uh, any given member's motivations for why they might call themselves spiritual or not, but not religious. I think in some cases you can see echoes of the awakening in those uh, motivations though as well. Does that answer your question? Wonderful, wonderful. More thoughts, questions, comments on this section? On the nature of mysticism? Yeah, Mike. So um, that's right. So the, the question is, um, does Edwards, or how often does Edwards preach sermons that don't sound like sinners in the hands of an angry God? And the answer is all the time, <laughs> all the time. Um, sinners is an anomaly. Um, and what is significant about it is it contains nothing like an altar call at the end of it. It's just God hates you and you're like a loathsome spider. And there isn't at the end of section, flee to Christ and be made beautiful. The reason is that Edwards knows, <laughs> right? Edwards knows his audience know that's what they should do, right? It would be like saying, fire, fire, there's a fire. And then the next day you read that in the newspaper and you say, oh, he should have told people you should run out the doors. Well, when I yell fire, implied in it is run out the doors. When Edwards says, God is angry with you, implied for the Puritan is flee to Christ. So it would have that meaning attached to it, just like yelling fire would have the meaning run for the doors embedded in it, right? The Puritans would already know. But even there, Edwards' normal sermon quality is altogether different from the sinners in the angry, hands of an angry God um, mode. Um, he does preach sermons like, I think the one you're thinking of, Mike, is Heaven is a World of Love, which is the last sermon in his Charity and Its Fruits sequence. Um, it's 1 Corinthians 13. Um, I used the bathroom before I uh, spoke, and I, I noticed he had the, 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 the phrase right there um, uh, on the wall. He preaches a sermon series of maybe 15 sermons on that one paragraph, um, Charity, Love, and Its Fruits. And the last one is Heaven is a World of Love in which it's all a beautiful description of the glories of heaven and the harmony and the beauty and on and on and on. Other sermons like that, the excellencies of Christ. Um, even God glorified in man's dependence. 
Um, all of Edwards' sermons take their title from the doctrine. The doctrine is the main thesis they were trying to defend. So as I'm rattling off these names, these are the, um, uh, these are the, the names that are often given, except Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which has its own title because it's anthologized in the Norton Anthology of English Literature for high school students all around America. So that's when you often get Edwards, when you're at your like, most moody, most anti-authoritarian 14-year-old, and this old dead guy tells you that God's not happy with you, you don't want to do your homework in the first place, and that's your entire experience with Edwards. So it took a massive moment of like, a rediscovery for people to learn that Edwards was something other than the fire and brimstone preacher that shows up in that one phrase in Lin-Manuel Miranda's uh, Hamilton. But yes, it's right to say that if you're looking for Edwards in his uh, The Beauty of Christ, in the devotional literature, the average tone and tenor of his sermon is about beauty and glory much more than it is about fire and damnation. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes, right here. You mentioned earlier that uh, interest in um, and the influence of Edwards had not yet crested in the rest of the world, even in the Cathedral of Britain, mm -hmm. like 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. What does that intensive interest elsewhere look like? Yeah, yeah. So institutionally, it means there are Edwards centers on, I think now every continent except uh, um, the Poles. Um, it means that there are uh, senior scholars in institutions that are doing Edwards-related work, uh, and they have graduate students around them that are doing Edwards-related work as well. They're publishing lots of different manuscripts. Um, in many cases, uh, it looks like um, looking at Edwards's particular relation to the particular country that they, these centers are, are themselves in. So here's one example. Um, the only publication of Edwards's that has never gone out of date or out of publication is his um, Journals of David Brainerd. David Brainerd is a missionary to the Native Americans and um, he gets sick and he uh, is in uh, Edwards's house uh, convalescing, but he doesn't get better. One of Edwards' daughters is taking care of him. They fall in love. They die probably the same sickness, close to the same time. Before he dies, Brainerd gives his journal to Edwards and says, hey, listen, if this is something, do what you will with it. If it's not, burn it. And Edwards finds the interior musings of a person who wants to take the gospel to a foreign people and decides it's good for the purposes of international missions. And there are international missions agencies that have sent that book with every missionary who has graduated from their institution for decades and decades and decades. With the result that if you were to go to a small Anglican church in sub-Saharan Africa, they may have 20 books in a library from the missionary that got there uh, 80 years ago, 100 years ago. One of them is David Brainerd's diary, edited and compiled by Jonathan Edwards. So you, you're, you're asking these questions then, so the South African um, Edwards Center, for example, is asking about the life of Edwardsian theology around Africa, for example. Um, and what does Edwards say, or what does it have to teach us in those sections where he talks about um, great divines, wonderful theologians, coming from um, the majority world all around the world? Something I'll say in just a moment when we discuss the awakening itself is Edwards sees himself as a member of an international Protestant revival uh, movement. It's tied in many of its cases to the spread of the British Empire. So wherever the Brits go, Edwards is going. And there's lots to find all around um, there. My friend runs the Edwards Center in Australia and he's an expert in um, Edwards' ecclesiology. Um, the Edwardsians in Europe are interested in his philosophical theology. Almost all of the Edwardsians in America are historians, including all of the Yale um, faculty. So they have differing um, expertises all around, but that's, that's a big thing. And again, one of the reasons is because um, uh, if you're, say, Korean, the likelihood that you're going to learn Latin in your, pri in your primary school is very, very low. The likelihood you'll learn English is very, very high, and all of Edwards' writing is all in English. So there's a, a facility with um, the language that most people around the world who are getting higher education 
already have. There's a lower barrier to entry. And there's not another uh, theologian like that of Edwards' stature who writes in English. The majority of the ones are writing in German or Greek or Latin, right, in the tradition. So does that answer your question a little bit about the landscape of, of global Edwardsianism? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. He's fired. Uh, and he was fired because he was tired of lukewarm Christians. <laughs> and he said, you can't take communion unless you really are a believer, which didn't make the congregation very happy. That's and right. then if you wanted to join the church, he sent you through a pretty rigorous process. Was this just a culmination of preaching both <laughs> yeah. He literally, he said, we're all going to meet. Yeah. All these people in my congregation, we're going to meet on judgment day, and God's going to determine yeah. whether I was right or you were Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now, is that, is that consistent? It's a great question. All the yeah. Just one thing more on that, on that story. So he burns the place down the way out, right? And then they can't find a supply preacher for a while. So he has to keep preaching there for a little while, right? I mean, so just, that's just, that kind of rhetoric, and then, you know, oh, yeah, I'll see you in seven days. Um, that's right. So just a bit of context. Solomon Stoddard, again, the Pope of the Connecticut River Valley, believes that the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, communion, can be um, a means of grace to the unregenerate. So you don't make a profession, take it anyway, and maybe God will speak to you in that way. That's out of accord with most of the tradition. Edwards is never convinced of Stallman Stoddard's position, in my view, right? Um, but uh, it's his grandfather and also his employer, so he doesn't really get a chance to say that much about it, and I think he sort of holds his tongue for a while before it becomes intolerable. So uh, we'll discuss in just a moment the, the bit of the, about the awakenings. Um, there, you can see here a fight between, I think, and this is perpetual in the history of the church. In the Nicene Creed, we confess that we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. And my sense is that there's some conflict, at least a tension, between the holiness and the oneness of the church, right? So you might have people who want to value the oneness and unity of the church and are happy to admit in all kinds of error for the preservation of the unity. There are others who are very interested in the holiness of the church and are happy to cause schisms if they can preserve the church's holiness. I don't know that there's a good, stable, long-term answer in the history of the church about how to weigh its oneness and its holiness. So one way to interpret what Edwards does in reviving the communion controversy toward the end of his tenure at Northampton is he thinks the unity is too high and the holiness needs to be ramped up a little bit. Um, and we're going to discuss the awakening in just a moment here. You'll, you'll see this again, the sense of what does it mean to be a real Christian? It's the dominant question of Edward's entire career. How do you distinguish true from false religiosity? And um, the, the awakenings make this question acute because often in the awakenings, it is people who are on the church rolls who are the ones who are experiencing the conversion, right? It's not like they're going off and they're talking to these like, dirty, filthy, unlearned pagans, right? No, it's, it's church people that are getting converted here. So it's a process of internal purification of the church. Again, it's, just, it's, it's voice rather than exit in the church. Yeah. yeah, so we'll say more about that as we go. Uh, let, let's turn our, our attention to the, the last little bit here, the awakening and its legacy. First, some facts about the awakening. I want to give you the smaller awakening first before we get talked to about the, the main awakening here. From 1734 to 1735, so just under two years, there's something called the Connecticut Valley Awakening. It begins among the youth who were the frequent subjects of Edward's complaint since they were, in his mind, so religiously unserious. But in April 1734, one of the young men in Northampton dies, suddenly, unexpectedly. In reply, Edwards preaches from Psalm 90, verses 5 and 6. The text is, Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as asleep. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. 
in the evening, it is cut down and withers. That's a natural typology, by the way. Right? The sermon had as its main appeal the living of a life so that one is prepared for even a sudden death. This is a theme as old as Socrates, who claimed that all of philosophy was preparation for death. But in Edwards, this is a theme that emphasizes the importance of not putting off the conscious decision to trust Christ for salvation, since death might come at any moment, including even for adults. This message was widely taken up. The youth flocked to it, and even some adults did as well, with the effect that membership at the church in Northampton grew to 650, which was almost the same size as the entire adult population of that city. The little revival in Northampton. It seems to be going well until one single event, which halted the awakening, the insuperable melancholy of one man. One of Edwards' uncles, Joseph Hawley II, had suffered for some time from distemper and melancholy. Melancholy is probably what we would call today depression. During the summer of 1735, he seems to have stopped sleeping altogether because his anguish is so acute. When pastors and others asked him what was wrong, he said that he was terrified about the state of his soul, convinced he was unregenerate, and the fastest way to determine the truth of that claim was to end his life. He was a shopkeeper from whom the Edwards family had previously purchased a set of kitchen knives. This meant that he had in his shop the instruments to put his plan into effect. And on June 1st, 1735, a Sunday, he did so. He bled out and died within a half an hour. The act was quickly attributed by Edwards and others to Satan's furious attempts to stem the work of God in New England. But even so, it signaled a cooling of revivalist enthusiasms of, in Northampton and a waning of enthusiasm for fire and brimstone preaching, at least for a while. And here arises an in question for interpretation of the Puritans. Are we to see the anxiety about salvation in Joseph Hawley as somehow representative of the entirety of the Puritan movement? Very many have done so, perhaps none as famously as the pioneering German sociologist Max Weber. In his story, as in many others, anxiety is closely related to the Calvinist doctrine of predestination. Weber's Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism sought to answer the question why capitalism or the commercial society developed where it did and not where it did not. The answer, he claimed, was Calvinism, and particularly its doctrine of predestination. Predestination, Weber said, meant that God chose some for salvation and left others for damnation before their birth. They had nothing to do with it. And that God's decision was unchangeable. Individuals did not know whether they were saved or damned, so they set off looking for signs of their election. Perhaps they thought worldly prosperity might be a supporting sign. Therefore, if they could possess worldly prosperity, that might assuage their anxiety about their salvation. So off they set to work fantastically hard, and along the way, they developed capitalism almost by accident. But the difficulty with this theory is simply this. The doctrine of predestination is not, like many think, a dividing line between Reformed and broader Western Catholic theology. Thomas Aquinas believed in unconditional election. Augustine, who is Calvin's foremost authority, interpreted, interpreted Paul as teaching unconditional election. And because of Augustine's peerless authority, all subsequent theologies in the Roman Catholic Church attempt to trace their own ideas back to Augustine. Basically, everybody believes in predestination. Something similar can be said with the freedom of the will. 
In Augustine's Handbook on Faith, Hope, and Love, he uses the metaphor of a person who commits suicide, who must be alive in order to do the act, but in the doing of the act, forfeits their life. So also, the will must be free in order to make the original movement towards sin, but in doing so, forfeits its freedom. Every Roman Catholic theologian takes Augustine to be the theologian. They can't disagree with this claim. And so, the freedom of the will and the belief in predestination are largely ecumenical Western doctrines. They don't pick out Calvinism from other versions. Now, they might distinguish Calvinism from Arminianism and various forms of liberal theology, but there's nothing distinctive to Calvinism about these doctrines. And so, I think the anxiety thesis is a bit overstated. Here's another way to think about this. If you know about Luther's salvation story, it's one that begins in anxiety when he's an Augustinian monk, a Roman Catholic. He is terrified that he has forgotten to repent of some sin, so he confesses for hours every day, drives his confessor crazy. What is the relief of his salvation, or of his anxiety? The doctrine of justification by faith alone. The same doctrines that the Calvinists heralded. So it would be strange, wouldn't it, if Luther adopted the doctrines and found in them relief from his anxiety, which were themselves the causes of anxiety in an entire civilization, Puritan New England. But maybe you don't have to go so far afield as Aquinas and Augustine and Luther. There's another way of explaining the fire and brimstone of Edwards and others, which is simply this that the average person wasn't terribly interested and didn't particularly care. After the Connecticut Valley Awakening, the people go back within six months to squabbling over which families had precedence in the seating boxes in the pews of the church. Historical records suggest at least 10% of first children were born before the eighth month of marriage. You can do the math on that one to figure out what's going on there. Church attendance waxed and waned. The perpetual story of these awakenings is how they decline almost immediately. If the Puritans were widely confronted daily with anxiety about their, their salvation, except outside of these short eruptions of fantastic religiosity marked by the awakenings, they hid it very well. But the awakening did have as one of its effects the introduction of Edwards to an international reformed audience. Even though the work of the revival was declining in Northampton, Edwards' reputation was on the rise. He wrote a letter detailing the events, a faithful narrative of the surprising work of God. It was published in London in 1737 under the guidance and supervision of the hymn writer Isaac Watts. In 1738, John Wesley, the Methodist, would publish an abridgment of it for his own Methodist followers. You can see something of a global pan-Protestant movement here, right? The Anglicans are interested in this, the Methodists, as well as the Congregationalists, but the Congregationalists are leading the way. By this time, back in Northampton, however, Edwards is already lamenting the decline of the awakening back into complacency. It is, he says, a great damp to that joy to consider how we decline and what decays that lively spirit in religion suffers among us, while others are rejoicing and praising God for us. So you see how ephemeral this early awakening is. By the time it's publicized around the world, it's already declining in New England. So in the late 19th, 1730s, the situation is this. Northampton and Edwards are internationally recognized, but the fires of piety had died. Luckily, Edwards now considered himself to be part of God's providential working in the world internationally. The fame from the faithful narrative gave him more contacts in England who wrote to him of a new preacher named George Whitfield, who was from the reformed wing of the Anglican Church, who was preaching to enormous crowds in England and who had trips planned to the colonies as well. Whitfield was, by all accounts, superhuman. 
Historians suggest that he may have spoken about a thousand times a year for 30 years straight. That's three times a day for three decades, every single day, without microphones. In fall 1738, he lands in Philadelphia, where he preached to a group of 8,000 people. That's two-thirds of Philadelphia's population. On that tour, he worked his way down south to Savannah, talking to the Methodists. The next year, he would return for a tour of the north and of New England. Edwards, now famous, wrote to Whitfield in February 1740, asking him to visit Northampton. Whitfield, having read the faithful narrative and having heard of the fame of Solomon Stoddard, agreed, but first, he would pass through Boston. In Boston, as a result both of his native charisma and canny advertising ability, the crowd that assembled to meet Whitfield on Boston Common was about 20 to 23,000 people. That number may not sound like much to us who have been in sports stadiums seating many multiples of that number. But in 1740, the entire population of Boston was 17,000 people. He's speaking to the entire city and then some. Whitfield's sermon on the Boston Commons was likely the largest public gathering in the entire history of the American colonies. Harry Stout of Yale sees Whitfield as the first great American star, proportionally far bigger than when the Beatles came. And the enormous crowds Stout sees as the seedbed for a civic consciousness that would form a sense of peoplehood and popular power, which within one generation would contribute to the American Revolution. I was an undergraduate at Georgetown during Obama's uh, first inauguration, and I got a ticket because I worked in the Hill, and the crowd was something like 1.2 million people on the National Mall. If you've ever been among a crowd like that, there's something strangely empowering and terrifying at the same time. There's a sense of the smallness of the individual, but the overwhelming power of the demos, the people, especially when no one's in charge. And that might be, Stout says, what those Bostonians felt hearing one man without the intermediation of any institutions or churches preach to the preach to the, them to the gospel. Stout says the awakening was the most momentous intercolonial popular movement before the revolution. Whitfield's single voice outside of any ecclesial authority or structure speaking unmediated to the masses becomes the template of so much subsequent American communication and rhetoric. How often do you hear, I'm going to go around the gatekeepers and tell you the truth just as it is? As Whitfield traveled around, he would sometimes suggest that perhaps the clergy had grown cold and forsaken their covenant. We've heard this rhetorical style before. It's the Jeremiah, but now aimed at the clergy, the religious establishment. This is called the reverse Jeremiah. It's not the prophet who is condemning the people, but the people who is condemning the prophet. The people are to believe the clergy, the authorities, the establishment itself was corrupt and craven, had forsaken the true gospel, grown cold in their affections. Three centuries later, these are themes that dominate our life as well. Elite institutions in jeopardy, populist fervor washing over crowds in the streets, something like moral revivals breaking out year by year, and it's not obvious whether they have any long-term effects. In conclusion, it would be a mistake to see in the Great Awakening an Ur myth that explains all of American life and everything that came afterwards. History doesn't work in so linear a fashion as that. But it is worth noting that almost a century after Whitfield, the greatest observer of American democracy ever to step foot on our shores, Alexis de Tocqueville, set down to explain to all of Europe what democracy in America is like. 
After he surveyed America's topography and natural resources in chapter one, he turns in chapter two of that book to identifying the point of departure of the Anglo-Americans. He said, in the cradle is the harbinger of the future, and the child is father to the man. What was the point of departure that Tocqueville saw? That set the institutions, habits, and customs that set the tone for all of American democracy? It wasn't the founding. That comes about 12 chapters later. Not the Constitutional Convention or the Founding Fathers. When Tocqueville wants to see where all of the deepest habits of America come from, he turns to the Puritan townships of New England. And if he was right, then the Congregationalists are the ones who have indelibly affected the American DNA. And with that, that's all I have. I'm happy to take questions, comments, and thoughts. Oh, we're a little bit over time. So any questions, comments, thoughts before we, before we get out of here? Yes, please. Went back. Oh, I think he, didn't he die in Georgia? I, I, yeah, he died in Georgia, I think, yeah. So he, he, he dies while he's in the middle of doing the, doing the work. Um, but the, you, can, you can run the story forward a few decades. Um, so again, it's, it's the same kind of story. So the, the awakenings come through. Uh, there's a fight between the sort of old lights and the new lights. Edwards functions as a kind of third way between them. These uh, sort of old uh, lights are centered around Massachusetts. Charles Chauncey is one of these names. Uh, he thinks that the revivals with all of the writhing and all of this nonsense are just um, uh, maybe demonic but probably unhelpful. And uh, on the other side, there are some who love the writhing and the yelling and the, uh, the, um, the fits of rage. Uh, John Davenport is one of the most famous ones. He, and this again is, is interesting for institutional history, he's a clergyman who leaves his church to be an itinerant preacher, um, which puts him outside of structures of ecclesial accountability. And he is running these sort of fantastical revivals with all the shouting and gyrations in the pews and all this. At one point, um, he, be, he gets a bonfire going and tells people to burn their vanities. Um, and it seems in the frenzy that he takes off his fancy pants and throws them into the fire. This is the preacher running the thing, now pantsless. And a woman uh, has a, the thought of mind to grab the pants off of the fire pile before it, they, they, they catch fire, give them back to him and tell him to, to get his act together. And he comes to himself and realizes, yeah, I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing here. So, so you see that this is the fight about the, the, the awakening. Um, uh, to what degree should we think that these gyrations are demonic or um, actual manifestations of the work of the spirit? Um, and Edwards is like again somewhere in the middle, but this is this is also interestingly contested. Remember, his wife is a mystic, and she has ecstatic experiences. Edwards himself might have them. If he doesn't have them, he's jealous of his wife for for not for having them more than he does. Or that's too vicious. Um, uh, he is admiring of his wife for having a more acute religiosity than he himself has. Um, and he finally hits upon the solution that uh, the mark of true religiosity is religious affections, a sense of the sweetness of divine things, which may have bodily expression, but need not. Uh, it's the move from, this is the metaphor he always uh, uses, from knowing that honey is sweet to tasting that honey is sweet. And that, in other words, is the sign of conversion. Um, when you go from a notional knowledge of God to an experiential knowledge of God. So to taste Christ as sweet is the mark that you are a true Christian. Because um, the demons know all the theology possible, and they're still damned. So the notional head knowledge of God doesn't save you. What the demons don't have going for them is they don't taste Christ's sweetness. And again, it's always a honey metaphor because of natural typology. And he loves, he also loves chocolate. He sends for chocolate in Boston all the time.
Anyway, that's the, the sort of course of the, of the awakenings. But then they all die down, and they need second great awakenings a few decades later. Um, and Timothy Dwight is involved with that at, at Yale. And you can, you can see the way these awakenings are um, fantastic in their spread, but relatively short in their duration. And I think that's worth thinking about. Um, I could have given this whole talk just from Tocqueville. I think he's just fantastic. One of the things that fascinates Tocqueville about American Protestantism is how these American Protestants go about um, their work every day uh, trying to undercut their competition to get a better deal on all of the goods they're selling. And then on Sundays, they come and they hear about how their riches are all in vain and they should seek a world that's not material at all. And it's a kind of uh, dissonance for Tocqueville, but it seems like the, 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 the stability and fecundity of America works by this dissonance. It has enormous productivity and the religion is there just long enough to remind people that they're not just buyers and sellers all the time. There's something important about this juxtaposition in the American soul between the acquisition of material goods and the recognition that life does not consist of the abundance of one's possessions. So in, in addition to theorizing the awakenings and their histories, you could also theorize the juxtaposition of the awakenings with the troughs of religiosity that go in between them. And I think that might be what Tocqueville is most interested in in shaping the American character. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Anything else before we depart? Well, go read some Edwards' fr friends. He's lots of fun. Uh, do start with Heaven is a World of Love if you're interested. I, I, your, my email is on the handout if you are interested. I could just send you the link. It'll be nice and easy. Thank you very much, uh, friends. I hope this was of some use to you. Thank you.